I see the first hand here by the pole. And I see a hand in the center in the back. And I can run my commentary as everybody comes up. So one of my pets that Lee has come up with, I think in healthcare, one of the things that's not well trained is palliative care, ethics, and communication. I'd invite you to comment on it as, as everybody lines up their questions and maybe we can start having hands up so that you can get the mics. I know there are, we have a hand right down here at the front. Thank you very much. Her hand was up very early. Front row. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. So I have three. So far. <laughs> Is it my turn? Yes, oh, your okay. question. So apparently I've got a microphone box I speak into. Works? Okay, cool. Um, so, so name? Claire Mills, sorry, um, from Paris. I have a question to Robin, really, and I guess, you know, reaching the last 10, 20% of people in any intervention is hard work and usually more expensive than reaching the mass, if you like. But do you feel that it was actually successful? I mean, if you've, if you've got an outcome where you've actually identified 19 people out of 1,400 plus, this is a very um, inefficient way of doing something, I guess. It, it, is, do you think it's really a successful thing, or do you think that there are going to be other things that will follow? Because feasibility is separate from, I mean, anything's feasible if you put the resources into it, but true feasibility also has to be a workable, realistic outcome. Okay. Oh, thank you. So we'll, we'll take the questions. The one thing I know is that when questions come, they're answered, they inspire more questions. So I'll let the originators get their questions out first. There's somebody out there. Let's see. Hello, um, I'm Kathleen England, and I'm from the Access Campaign in uh, Geneva, Malawi, in the prison scenario. My question is, have you, did you assess any of the loss to adherence once patients were re released from the program? Is one question. And for the self-testing for Swaziland, what is the potential of this to be off the shelf um, in the pharmacy from your experience? I think this is where, the most, uh, where we would like to see this happen, where people can have autonomy in their testing. Um, and for DRC, um, NCDs for diabetes in the HIV, di diabetes in the HIV program, were, was, was TB assessed at all for the diabetics, diabetic patients, since we know there's a comorbidity there? And that's it. Okay, and there was one on that, Andre. Was there a hand on that right side? The first questionnaire pretty much asks the same question as me. So. Same questions? OK, thank you. All right. OK, we'll have one there, and then we'll have the online speakers. Uh, you at the back? Sarah Wookie. Okay. Sarah Wookie, doctor. Um, you uh, I've got a question for the, um, <coughs> uh, the diabetes um, project, in, uh, particularly in Mueso. Um, you've said that there's a particular t uh, group of patients who have a type of diabetes which isn't clearly classified as one or two that's associated with current and previous uh, malnutrition. And I'd like to know if there have been any studies looking at um, what treatment in this particular group is most successful. Thank you. Okay, online. Uh, yes, we've had lots of um, questions online, so I'm just selecting the most popular ones. Um, but for Rinaldo, um, in Malawian prisons, did you detect any drug resistance? Do you think there might have been any survival bias introduced in your study design? And then for the self-testing talk, um, a question, did you analyze whether this approach reached a different population to health facility-based testing? And also, um, do you think the unassisted, unassisted testing was a reason for 30% of youngsters having done a test as a hard to reach group? And also, were you able to understand the main reasons for not getting confirmed, which I believe was 13 out of 34 HIV self-tested reactive cases? 
I think that's quite a bit of work for <laughs> the lineup here. We can start the answers, and maybe we'll start on the extreme, right? Uh, okay, so just in terms of palliative care training needs, um, I think there's definitely a deficit in terms of um, curriculums for healthcare workers when it comes to palliative care. Um, usually, palliative care is a few is a, a, a short couple of weeks or a few sessions um, within curriculums, and it is so vital that healthcare workers actually understand what palliative care is. Therefore. Um, Countries and um, institutions should prioritize palliative care, not necessarily the um, advanced palliative care um, um, practices, but the principles of palliative care and ethics, which is key to managing and um, approaching patients in a patient-centered way, um, should be um, as, um, put, should be put as part of every curriculum for healthcare workers. Thanks. So thanks for the questions about the diabetes program in the DRC. So the first one was about um, whether patients, we, if we knew if they had HIV or TB. Um, in Mueso, HIV status was not actually documented in this cohort. And self-reported history or current TB was um, in 2.7% of the cohort. Um, and just for Swaziland, actually, we only knew um, the TB status of 11% of the cohort of 800 plus patients. Um, and of the, the HIV positive patients who were enrolled in the NCD program, th this was only, it represented only 1% of the total HIV cohort of that clinic. So the idea of having integrated the two types of care and you know, changing some of the um, protocols for the HIV and TB service to integrate a screening for NCDs and vice versa in the NCD part to encourage HIV testing um, were probably not realized to the extent that, that it was hoped. So, so we don't have a lot of data about the, um, the kind of dual diagnoses of these groups. The second question was about <coughs> malnutrition-related diabetes. So actually, very, very little is known about this, and it's quite contentious. Um, there were some <coughs> studies reported, literally just cross-sectional analyses from the 1990s from Ethiopia, for example, but very little is in the literature. And now there seems to be a renewed interest as there is more focus on non-communicable diseases, including diabetes in sub-Saharan Africa. So, so it is not known at all what is the most, um, the ideal treatment for this type of diabetes. Very little is known at all about it. It's very interesting, I think, and should be explored more. Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you for these questions. Is this, is this on, you can hear me? Okay, <clears throat> and the first one is a very pointed one. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Why did we consider this a success? Because we did only find 19 confirmed HIV cases. Um, I wondered this myself, but uh, I think the, the main goal of this was, I mean, overarching as a strategy, obviously, is to find the un, undiagnosed HIV cases. But we considered this a success because uh, so many people accepted the tests. We didn't have any um, adverse events reported. And actually, also because the Ministry of Health accepted the idea of HIV self-testing uh, as a strategy in the country. I think there was initially some resistance, which links actually to the next question um, about the off-the-shelf uh, purchasing of these testing kits that depends on the Ministry of Health at the moment. Um, there's this request that the tests be distributed by trained uh, counselors, HIV testing counselors. Um, I can probably add a comment from our Kenyan experience. Mm, so one of the things that happened in Kenya in the, H the National AIDS Control Program was the recognition mm. that as a national program, the government can't provide and pay for everything but there's a need for guidelines to guide how things are implemented, even in private care. So we have HIV self-testing kits in certain pharmacies, and we have some programs, um, funded programs, which have subsidized the cost. Mm -hmm. So at least within the urban areas of Nairobi, there are certain pharmacies where you can walk in and purchase an HIV self-test kit. And we haven't seen any adverse events so far, or even in the research pilots that have been done to explore the same. Mm. So it's feasible, I think we can say. Yeah. Maybe different in different populations. 
Um, if I could then respond to the online community questions, maybe just one. Um, there was a question about whether or not we explored if this approach was different to the health facility testing. And I would say these are not actually separate, as we also distributed the self-tests in facilities. Um, but we, we have seen from just our routine program data in terms of community testing that the people are, are different. We do reach more men with the community-based testing than facility-based testing. And this was approximately similar with the blood-based testing in community compared to the self-testing in community. Um, and actually, surprisingly, in terms of the youth, uh, we found that there were actually more youth in the facilities. And I think it's because it's the young women uh, who are coming for ANC and PNC, and they were offered self-testing as well. Um, and there were fewer in the community. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hello. Yeah. Regarding the adherence at the release of program, actually, we monitor uh, during 2017, during six months, uh, the prisoners are released uh, for HIV and TB continuation of treatment in the facilities. Uh, and we managed to trace them 80% of them that were linked to a care uh, in a facility through phone calls and, and home visits. Um, in regards of the DRTB question, uh, well, fortunately, Malawi uh, does not have a high prevalence of uh, drug-resistant TB, so we haven't found any case of uh, drug-resistant TB in prison uh, with the gene expert tests that we have done. So. Okay, so you, you screened for it. You just didn't find any? Yeah, we did. Okay, I yeah. think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we've answered most of the questions, and I, it looks like we still have time. Yeah, for another round. And I see one, two, three hands up. Four. Okay. Five. Five. Hi, my name's Jeremy Hill. I'm a TB doctor. I work in the Western Pacific. Um, my question is for Ronaldo. Obviously, a case notification rate of 4% is extraordinarily high. Um, so just thinking about control strategies, you didn't mention um, uh, building design and airspace turnover, which I think has been a key component in evidence from similar settings in mines and hospitals and schools in South Africa. I just wonder if you could talk a little, you showed a picture, but could just talk a little bit more about, did you measure airspace turnover or um, you, you know what, what sort of occupational type um, strategies you might you know, you have assessed or be thinking about implementing. OK. Strategies for control. Um, how do I say this? Can I use the clock? Top left on my side. Oh. We'll keep coming down. Hi. OK. Daryl Stelmack, um, Manson Unit, MSF UK. Just a question for Lee. What is uh, spiritual counseling in the MSF context? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, top right. Mm -hmm. Yes. The lady on the right. Top right. Yes. Yes. Hello. Thank you. My name is Mechi, working with uh, MSF OCA. My question is for Mr. Tarkino, uh, Mozambique. First of all, thank you for your very interesting presentation. My question to you is um, taking into account that the PEP adherence, the HIV prophylaxis for survivors of sexual violence is very challenging in any context. I think as an average we reach about knowing that 50% does manage to complete. Your cascade shows that at 12 months you manage to keep 25%, if I'm not mistaken. And my question is, um, what do you see as the next step? Because offering this prophylaxis to the key population you are working with, I think, is very interesting. But if we learn that we keep 25% on treatment, I'm very interested to, to understand what are you going to do with the information you have at this moment? OK, thank you. And we had a question lower down. Who had the mic? The lady on the left. Hi, uh, Tamar from the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Um, for time, I'll restrict it to three of you. Um, so uh, Robin, Aaron and Lee, um, I'm really interested to know just generally what's happening next steps with the research uh, specifically and whether you have um, plans in place, um, and if so, what are they? Thank you. 
All right. Um, I think we can have a meal, but oh, you've been having your hand up for a while. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Wale Salami from Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, Nairobi, Kenya. Um, my question goes to Robin on the self-testing. Uh, what do you think could be the reason why there's such a low uptake of self-testing uh, by women uh, from the community testing? And the other question is, what do you think is really the, the benefit of the assisted testing versus the non-assisted testing? What do you think of the cost perspective? Thank you. The gentleman in the middle. There's no discrimination in sitting in the middle. Seat. Hello, hello. Uh, hi, I'm, my name's Jacob. I work for the emergency team. Um, this is a question for Reynaldo. I draw a comparison between some of our recent work in uh, Libyan detention centres, and um, I wonder if you saw any um, further stigmatization or, or violence towards the, the, the people in detention once they were on treatment and if that affected their adherence to treatment. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we'll just do one more and then allow the speakers to respond. Do we have any? Hello, Dominique Diang from uh, MSF OCB. Uh, my question is for Robin. Uh, you have talked about the involvement of traditional healers. I would like to know more about it. Thank you. Yeah, that's an important question. Thank you. I think we can start. You had many questions. Yeah. Just. Okay, in regard to the strategies for control, um, actually, um, well, it is it's quite uh, difficult to, to establish uh, infection control in regards of isolation, particularly in prison. That's something that we have tried to do uh, in uh, particular sick bay cells that we can put prisoners during a short period of time. But unfortunately, because of congestion, it's very difficult to keep them longer than at least one to two weeks. Uh, and we have tried to do that in, in particular in Maula prison. In Chichiri prison, we couldn't find a space to do in this isolation. But it's part of our proposal, actually, of part of the strategy control. Um, contact tracing um, as part of the strategy. Uh, we have done a bit of follow-up of prisoners and their contacts, but it's very difficult to do so in prison. But as they change every other two weeks or three weeks from one cell to other cell, so uh, 150 prisoners in one cell all together, uh, it's very difficult to do it inside prison as a, as a part of uh, uh, contact tracing, but uh, we are planning to do it in this new proposal for every prisoner that is uh, having an active TB at entry to at least do contact tracing uh, from the family uh, and trying to see around the, the, the closest uh, uh, relative friends. Um, yeah, and yeah, for sure what we try to do as well is uh, trying to complete treatment and follow up as, as much as possible. So treatment success rate is higher than 90% in prisoners. Uh, inside prison, and uh, the ones that have uh, uh, exited, actually, we try to, to follow as well and to see that they are linked to care, but it's very difficult to, to follow some of them. Um, regarding the violence question and adherence to treatment, indeed, is something that we have, uh, have seen as a challenge at the beginning of our intervention, as, as uh, violence was uh, produced inside prison cells at the beginning. Uh, but uh, with our intervention and the work that we have done, uh, they uh, start, stop to do uh, violence inside prison from prison uh, uh, guards themselves. But sometimes we receive prisoners that are uh, in police cells before coming to prison that are stop of their treatment when they are already under ART or TB treatment. Uh, and they sometimes are victims of torture. And this is something that we have addressed. We do medical certificates and we link with uh, partners working with human rights. And yeah, unfortunately, ICRC is not in Malawi, for example. But we work with other organizations that could help us to link and to address this situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, I think the first one and the last one are linked, actually. So the first question was about the next steps for HIV self-testing research. Um, so I'll speak uh, just first about the first next step, which is uh, integrating self-testing into our pre-exposure prophylaxis study um, in Swaziland. So this will happen in two ways. Uh, we will provide self-tests to PrEP clients to use in between their visits. We've also seen like the Mozambique study that 
a lot of clients don't come back for their first month visit. So the hope is that if we give them the self-tests, at least they'll have then um, a test that they can use uh, even if they don't come back to the clinic for their follow-up visit after they finish PrEP. Um, and then we will also give it to these PrEP clients um, to distribute to their partners who have unknown HIV status. And uh, so the idea about the traditional healers, this one is a little bit further away in terms of implementation. We're still trying to work out the strategy, um, but the idea is that in order to optimize the, the utility of these HIV self-testing, uh, we hope to distribute them through the non-trained healthcare workers. So this was the strategy including traditional healers as well as peer educators. And so um, our community teams in the Shisawini region are quite linked already with a few traditional healers that um, are, I, I would say, maybe more open to a biomedical approach. Uh, and the idea would then be to have them undergo a training um, and be able to provide HIV self-testing to clients that would then come to them for um, any issues instead of going to the more formal health system. Um, and then there was another question over here from uh, Kenya uh, about the low uptake um, of self-testing by women in the community. And I actually uh, would rephrase it. I don't think it was a low uptake of self-testing by women. It was actually a rather higher uptake of men. So um, there's a lot of opportunities for women to test in health facilities, primarily linked to pregnancy. Um, and so the community strategies are rather targeted towards men. Um, they went to workplaces, uh, the forestry industry where men are working. And uh, so this, I think, would be why the, the gender distribution was more equal. Uh, and then the last point about the benefit of the assisted testing, I think, is to increase um, knowledge and capacity and uh, understanding of how to use the test and then eventually one person will then tell another person and then eventually maybe there's a, a, a more clear understanding of how to use the test. Okay. So I think the last comment is from Lee and I'm wondering if even you've had a comment at all. I have a, so mm -hmm. can I? Yes, please. <clears throat> so thank you for the question. Uh, the next step uh, about PrEP, yes. Um, actually, we can um, think about uh, improving PrEP at three different levels. The first one at community level, as I said, uh, we use uh, uh, peer educators in the recruitment, and this was a very great uh, uh, advantage. So improving behavior change and communication programs in community may lead uh, to be PrEP more uh, acceptable and eventually individuals be more aware about the, the, the importance of the, of the program and also uh, empowering the community the association of MSM uh, across the country can lead a great help in uh, um, uh, in, improve the prep intake among this population. At healthcare program, the next step is to include the, the prep in the HIV package at health centers level, and this is a very uh, good discussion we are having with Minister of Health in Mozambique, and we hope that can lead uh, to a positive result. And at national level, um, offering this was a. Um, a, a an observation, a suggestion given by many of our participants, offering PrEP also in pharmacies or in other, or in other uh, uh, public places where they can take PrEP uh, and uh, without having any uh, kind of stigmatization. So for us, this is the next step in Mozambique. Thank you so much. So Lee, you're between the audience and the tea break. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, th I think a good place to start for um, clinicians and MSF in terms of spiritual counseling is really acknowledging that pain is not only physical, it can be spiritual, and then making sure that patients engage to their spiritual leaders, healers, pastors, whoever they are, but making sure that that happens for the patient. And then last question, what is the next step? There's been loads of palliative care research, even within drug-resistant TB. So the research is out there. There's guidelines, WH, WHO guidelines, South African guidelines, but there's no implementation. So it's time for action. Thanks. I think you've done it. You've been an amazing audience. We've had an amazing group of presenters. And we'll just do three sharp claps of thank you very, very much. Thank you.